Brethren, during this time of year, of course, there's going to be things that um, will be talked about and discussed leading up to the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. And they all seem to revolve around a singular three-letter word. Anybody know what that three-letter word is? That'd be sin. Yes. So during these days leading up to the Passover and Unleavened Bread, we're supposed to be what? We're supposed to be looking inwardly, introspectively, I believe the word is. Introspectively? Intro whatever that word is, we're supposed to be looking inside ourselves uh, to see what lies in our heart. Remember the last message that I gave up here dealt with our character, and that goes to our heart, our being, who we are as a person. And we're supposed to be doing something. We're supposed to be looking inside ourselves to see well, what's in there that I need to root out? Because those things are sinful things that shouldn't be in there. But they've gotten in there over time, somehow, some way. So taking some time to discuss just what exactly that three-letter word is, what sin is, is what we're going to do today. I've entitled this message, Sin as Defined in the Bible, or Sin as Defined in God's Word. So what exactly is sin, brethren? And do you understand how the Bible defines it? Now, as Christians, we know that we're supposed to be avoiding sin. But how can we avoid sin if we don't necessarily quite know or comprehend what it is? On the surface, we know what sin is, but maybe by the end of this message, you may see some things that you may have not thought about um, or ways of looking at sin that uh, you can look at and deal with leading up to the spring holy days. Now, the Bible defines sin in several scriptures of the Bible, and we'll go through some of those in a few minutes, each of which gives a better understanding of what it is. But like I said, but before we look at these scriptures, let's look at the definitions of the word sin to, so we can get a better idea of what it means. So there are two broad concepts to look at here. There's both the Hebrew and the Greek words translated for sin. And they're throughout the Bible, and they, were large, they evolve largely around two major concepts. Now the first is that of transgression. Now to transgress just simply means to step across or to go beyond a set boundary or a limit. Now, this cop can be compared to an uh, athletic playing field, like a football field or a soccer field, right? Because there are lines delineating on the outside of that field where the players are supposed to be kept inside of that. And so if they step outside of that boundary, they have committed a transgression and they have gone out of bounds. The limits are set to define that playing area, and the players are to stay within that area. Just like if this mat that I'm standing on today, if that was the boundary that was set for me up here as the speaker, I shouldn't be going outside of that boundary. So that's the, f the first look at what sin is. Most of the other words translated sin in the Bible revolve around a second concept, that of being to miss the mark. Again, to use a sports analogy, if a player aims, if a football kicker is up there at the 15-yard line, per se, and even though the goalposts are narrowed a little bit for this past season and future seasons in football, if he doesn't get the football through those goalposts, how many points does he get for his team? Zero. None instead of three. So in, in that sense, he missed the mark of getting the ball through the goalposts. He missed the goal that he was aiming for. Now this view of sin includes the concept of our, you and I as Christians, going in one direction, but then straying off that direction, straying off course to the side, and continuing in the direction that we intended to go to begin with. So even if you are going straight ahead and you just veer off one degree, that one degree over time is going to keep widening and widening and widening that scope 
If you're over here, and when you're supposed to be here, that's not necessarily a good thing for a Christian to be. So we end up missing the mark or, or the direction that we were supposed to be going in. So this concept also encompasses the idea of failing to measure up to a specific standard. For example, most college courses, most school classes that we have taken over the, the years, um, we've had tests and we've been graded or judged on those tests, haven't we? And there's a minimum standard that we need to meet in order to pass that test or whatever, what have you. If we don't meet that standard, we fail that test or that course. So a minimum level of performance is expected, and anything less of that standard is failure. So by not meeting that standard, we miss the mark, or we don't pass. We can miss the mark either by missing the goal, like I said earlier, at which we are trying to aim for, or by falling short of that goal. In either situation, we fail to reach the mark that was set before us to begin with. Now both of these concepts, transgressing and missing the mark, they involve a basic, very simple requirement. And maybe you picked up on it. If we transgress, which means, like I said, to cross over a set boundary or limit, then there has to be that set boundary or limit to cross over to begin with, correct? Or if we miss the mark, there must be some type of mark or some type of target or standard that we in fact have to miss. So sin, in its basic simplest form then, is simply to transgress those boundaries that God has set for us or to miss the target that he has set for us. Now this is where the biblical definitions of sin become important because these scriptures define those set boundaries or standards that God has set for us. They define the playing field which we are to live our lives in, so to speak. They also define the goal that we are aiming for, the minimum standard that we are expected to meet as Christians. In other words, the biblical definitions of sin show us the standards that God has given us that define what is acceptable to him and also what is not acceptable. They show us, brethren, what measures, what measures up and what falls short of those standards that God has set in place for his people. Now, the definitions of sin in the Bible are not simply arbitrary do's and don'ts. Instead, they show us the way that God wants us to live our lives. They show us the spiritual principle by which he lives his life. And it's those standards, brethren, of conduct that God expects us to be living by in our lives. So for our first scripture, which you may have already gone to um, in Sabbath past over the, this process of preparing for the upcoming Holy Days, would be 1 John chapter 3. If you would like to turn there to 1 John chapter 3. And we'll look at verse 4. Now in 1 John 3, 4, it says, If we transgress his law, God's law, what then? What then are the boundaries and standards God has set for us that define sin? Well, the most basic definition of sin is here in 1 John 3, 4. It says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth, transgresseth also the law. For sin, it says, is the transgression of of the law. That taken from the King James Version. So here we see God defines the boundary for mankind. He says that sin is in fact transgressing his holy spiritual law. Now breaking that law, crossing that divine boundary, so to speak, that limit that God set for us, anything beyond that would then in fact be sin. When we look at 1 John 3, 4 and other translations, we see another important perspective. Here's how the New King James translates this verse. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. 
Now that word lawless, lawlessness in the Greek is, is anomia, A-N-O-M-I-A. And it simply means without law or against law. Now the concept conveyed here is that sin is an act of, in violation of God's law and basic moral principles. This refers to actions that are not just outside the bounds of God's law, but also actions that are in deliberate rebellion against those laws, deliberately trampling on and rejecting that boundary. So if I knew that if I stepped outside of this mat, I would be sinning, that would be a transgression of God's law, right? But if I willingly do it, then I am knowingly transgressing God's law. And that's the first thing that we need to know about sin is that we can do it actively and participate on our own. So instead of knowing that there is a set of boundaries, we as Christians try to live by and keep ourselves within the limits and not, uh, and not go over them. God gave humanity his laws to show us his way of love. Those laws define how we demonstrate love to God, but more importantly to our fellow man. Sin is a direct violation of the law of love. God showed us a way to live in peace and harmony with him and with mankind and defined this way of life by his love for us and in his law. So when we sin, we violate or transgress that boundary and break God's law. Now there's a broader definition of sin that goes along with this one that we'll look at. So we see that we've just seen how one standard of transgressing the law that God has set up for mankind. He expects obedience to his laws. So God's laws define acceptable behaviors and actions. And when we break that standard of God's law, we step across the bounds that he has set for us. But has God put other boundaries for us, other ways in which he defines sin? What about actions and behavior that aren't covered necessarily by specific laws? Well, we're already in the book of 1 John, so just flip over a couple pages to chapter 5, verse 17. We find a much broader definition of sin. It just simply states, all unrighteousness is sin. From the New King James Version, all righteousness is sin. Now, other Bible versions help us more fully understand the meaning of this word. In the Amplified Bible, it says, all wrongdoing is sin. Every kind of wrongdoing is sin. That taken from the New Life Version. The Phillips translation says, every failure to obey God's laws is sin. And the New Living Translation states, all wicked actions are sin. Now the basic driving force of this scripture is that if any action or behavior is wrong, then it is sin, right? The word translated unrighteousness, wicked action, wrongdoing, or every failure in these versions is the Greek word adikia, A-D-I-K-I-A. -I now the Expositor's Dictionary of Bible Words defines this word as action that causes visible harm to other persons in violation of the divine standard. Other meanings of this word and its verb form are evildoers, dishonest, unjust, wickedness, to be unfair, to harm, to mistreat, to hurt, and to wrong, or as in to wrong another person. These meanings, brethren, go beyond just the physical deeds and actions and cross over into attitudes and motives for those actions and what goes on up here in the mind. They involve what we think. And from this viewpoint, we see the beginnings of what, of a different type of standard, one that involves not just what we do, but who we are as a person. 
And Jesus Christ points this out in Matthew chapter 5, if you'd like to turn there. In Matthew 5, Jesus Christ reveals an underlying principle to this point. In Matthew 5, verses 22 and 21 and 22, excuse me, he says, You have heard it was said of those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But, he continues on, whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Now one commonly understood standard of behavior during, back during those times of Jesus Christ and as a matter of fact, for today, in our time, was to refrain from murdering another human being. If someone committed murder, he would himself be put to death, usually by stoning. Here in Matthew 5, Jesus drew attention to the law's underlying principle, which is, if you think of other people as worthless, viewing them as undeserving of life or even their existence, then you are in danger of eternal death, not just the physical stoning. Jesus Christ showed that sin includes not only those physical actions that we do, but also our thoughts and our attitude that go behind and back up those actions. He further explained down a little bit in verses 27 and 28. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, he says, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That heart being that, that inner character that we have and that we're trying to build on as Christians. Christ said that this sin is not defined just by a physical action. If we even allow such a thought to enter our minds, we have in fact sinned. We have mentally crossed that boundary and thus trampled that limit or that set boundary that God has said, don't go beyond this set point. From this, we should realize then, brethren, that sin starts in the mind. And when we allow evil thoughts to enter our mind and stay there, we eventually let these evil thoughts spring into actions leading us to sin. This is brought out in the book of Proverbs 23, verse 7. You can just write that down where it states, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he, or so is she. Proverbs 23, verse 7. Jesus told those of his day who were obsessed with physical cleanliness and ritual washings that it isn't what goes on into our bodies that defiles us, but rather the evil that is already there in our minds that debases a person. Now, humanly speaking, we don't necessarily see anything wrong with allowing wrong thoughts to enter our minds, do we? Often, many people think that they are quite pleasurable and entertaining, but we should not, because eventually those sinful thoughts will lead that person to sinful actions. And that result is trampling on God's law. We need to be reminded and remember that, brethren. Jesus Christ instructs us to disrupt that process before it even gets started by not even allowing wrong thoughts to enter our minds. Now this goes even a bit further. In Romans 14, if you would like to start turning there, God reveals yet another other ways in which we can fail to measure up to his standards. In this chapter, the Apostle Paul wrote to a congregation composed of Jews and Gentiles, the Romans. And he's, he was discussing how their different backgrounds had affected them. You see, during this time period, the Roman Empire 
of the time, literally dozens of holidays were observed, including feast days, fast days, during which certain foods would either be eaten or not eaten, to be avoided. Now those who had been members of the church for some time knew that such practices had no meaning to them as Christians. So they ate whatever they wanted to. But others who maybe have just been called into the church out of that Roman background, where they were offended at the eating of such foods. Now this created conflicts among the, the congregation itself because the new members had spent their whole lives thinking and eating particular foods that was wrong on a particular day of the calendar year. Now to this end, the Apostle Paul addressed this problem starting in verse 19, telling the Christians to be careful that they don't offend those either newer or weaker in the faith. So in Romans 14, starting in verse 19, he says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. He says, Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Continuing on, it is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Verse 22, do you have faith, he asks. Have it to yourself before God. And he goes on, happy is he who does con not condemn, excuse me, himself in what he approves. Then, brethren, notice what Paul says in verse 23. He says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith, he says, is sin. There's that three-letter word again. So here we see a, yet a third standard that defines sin for us. And Paul states it, whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, just what is God telling us in this passage? Well, from the context, we are told that if we violate our conscience, our inner thoughts, then we are, in fact, sinning. If you do something that you feel you shouldn't, in fact, be doing, you are sinning. Now, why is this a sin to begin with? Why would you think it is sinful? Because mentally and spiritually, we are comprised compromising, excuse me, ourselves when we do something that we know we ought not to be doing in the first place. Because when we do that, what are we doing? We're compromising not only ourselves and maybe others along with us, but more importantly, we are compromising our character. And character is very crucial to our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ because we are supposed to be building up that type of godly, godly character. And what was talked about during the announcements and in the sermonette in Galatians 5. Putting off those things that we know not to be doing and putting on those things that we should be doing and acting and saying. And God expects us to build spiritual, mature, godly character in this life. We know that. And become more like him, more like his son, Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth. We build eternal godly character by remaining faithful to what is right in spite of all the pulls to the contrary, in spite of all the, all the resistance that we get from others that we may come in contact with or with the world. We resist the temptation to do things that we know we should not do. We live by faith that God will give us the strength to endure whatever trials that we face in this life. But when we compromise, when we tear down that character that we've worked so hard to build up, we are in fact giving in. And every time we give in, we find it that much harder to regain what we have lost and that much easier on the other end of the spectrum to give in the next time. I have a little bit of analogy. How many people like chocolate? Raise of hands. 
You don't like, oh, you get two hands. So everyone in this room likes chocolate. If I had, I should have brought Hershey's bar with me. If I handed out just one little square piece of a Hershey bar to you and had you eat it, and then say you can have as much of, more of the chocolate as you wanted, would you just be content with that one little piece or would you want more of that little piece of chocolate? More. In the exact same way, if we give in to sin through our conscience and say, oh, well, it's not that bad. And, you know, I didn't get caught, right? No one saw anything. I, you know, I'm still here. I haven't been smote with lightning or anything from God. Then, hey, it must not be so bad. And then the next time, it just is easier to give in to that type of sinful nature. One of the most insidious things about compromise is that it spreads very easily. If we would get away with something, like I said, once, we find it much easier to try it again the next time. In compromise, it grows like a cancer. It comes on slowly, but then, like I said, it spreads out. And before you know it, you can be in the fight of your spiritual life, literally. That is why God says that if our actions aren't done in faith or according to faith, they are in violation of our conscience, and so we are sinning. Brother, we need to be sure that what we do is out of faith and confidence that is in right and acceptable standards to God or just not do whatever it is. We need to be sure our motives are right and our conscience remains clear in doing everything that we set out to do each and every day. And for this reason, it is vital that we properly educate our conscience so that it is in accordance with God's word, the Bible. Because it is not within our natural human ability to discern right from wrong. We may think that we're smart and very capable human beings, which we all are. But there are times that we are, that we do commit some type of sinful act. It happens to the best of us. So no, there is never a time when we should think that we are in control of ourselves. You can write down another verse, Jeremiah 10, verse 23. He says, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. On our own, we can't do it. And so we need something bigger than ourselves to save us from our own self. And by learning God's ways, they help define what's right and what's wrong. So we have a better chance of succeeding and being faithful the next time. But God wants, us, God wants us to live within the boundaries and standards he has set for us and to change our values, our attitudes, and thoughts and lives so that they are in line with those standards, with his standards, and not our own. The process of conversion can simply be defined as replacing our standards, values, and thoughts with those of God's, his standards, his values, and his thoughts. But sin can also be something else, something that maybe you hadn't thought of before. We have seen the ways that we can sin by what we do, as well as by what we think, right? In case you haven't noticed, the standard God expects us to keep gets getting higher and higher. For us to meet. And this last definition of sin may be the most difficult of all. Did you realize or have you thought about that we could go through life without ever stealing, ever lying, ever hating another person or breaking a single commandment from God, all while perfectly controlling our thoughts and yet still sin every day of our lives? We could avoid all of those things 
but we could still be sinning according to this last definition of sin. Most of us probably don't even realize that we are involved in this last kind of sin. And we probably don't even realize that it is in fact sinning. What is it? Like I said, we have seen that we can sin by the things that we do. But, can we also sin by the things that we don't do? Turn to the book of James. James chapter 4, verse 17. It says something about this. James 4, 17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do, to do good and does not do it, what does it say? To him, it is sin. Perhaps you heard of sins of commission, sinning by our actions that we take. Stealing, lying, committing adultery, and so on and so forth. But, in James 4.17, this verse tells us that some transgressions involve sins of omission. Sinning by things that we omit doing altogether. James tells us that if we know to do good, we recognize that we ought to do certain things then, right? And then the failure to do those things is, in fact, sin. We are not meeting the standard that God has set for us. We are missing that mark, so to speak. The four Gospels are filled with examples of sin. We know that. Jesus often clashed with those who were dealing who were diligent about strict liberal, literal obedience to God's laws, but they never realized what God expected more of them. In Christ's days, the Pharisees referred to detailed lists of what they could and could not do, and what was lawful and unlawful to do, say, on the Sabbath day, a day like today. They were so diligent about tithing, weren't they? Down to the last little bit down to the last seed of grain of, or spice. They spent hours studying the law, fasting, and praying. Yet Christ called them blind guides. He called them hypocrites. He called them a brood of vipers, didn't he? These people simply don't comprehend the intent of God's law. They put great effort into not committing sins, didn't they? but concentrated so much on this struggle that they failed very miserably at doing what they should have done and been doing all along. Consider the conflicts that they had with Jesus Christ. The biggest disagreement was over this day, the Sabbath day. They were infuriated that Christ healed on the Sabbath. According to their teaching, one person could only provide medical help or treatment on the Sabbath if the situation were only life-threatening to another person. Thus, when Jesus performed a great miracle on the Sabbath, healing those who had been crippled or sick for years, the Pharisees were absolutely furious with him. So instead of rejoicing for those who were healed, they just got enraged by the fact that Jesus Christ was doing so on the Sabbath day. In fact, they wanted to kill Christ because in their distorted view, he was breaking the Sabbath. They were blind, in fact, that, Jesus, that what Jesus was doing was good. And that he was easing the misery and pain of people who had suffered maybe for years before that time that he healed them. It was because of their unwilling spirit, spiritual blindness, brethren, and hostility, hostility that Christ called them hypocrites and snakes. And so this means that if we are that way, that we have to change. We should learn an important lesson from this. And that's that strict obedience to God's laws alone doesn't change who we are as a person. It's a start, that's for sure. As we have seen, obedience to his laws is a standard that God expects us to meet every day of our lives. But there's more to it than that. 
Sometimes we make the same mistake that the Pharisees made. We can concentrate so much on avoiding breaking God's laws that we lose sight of the purpose of the law and what its intent was to begin with. So in that regard, we need to change our focus from thinking about ourselves and being concentrated and more concerned about showing our love for others and for God's laws. If you would turn to Matthew chapter 25. Now we may think that never breaking God's law is that's good enough, isn't it? But what did Jesus Christ say about that? Well, in Matthew chapter 25, we get an answer. Only a few days, actually, before his execution, Jesus made clear an obligation for those who would, in fact, follow him, who would be people of the way, as they were considered in the early days, people who were later on considered Christians. In Matthew 25, starting in verse 31, he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in, or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Verse 40, and the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Verse 41, then he will also say to those on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. And going down a few verses to verse 46. He says, and these are those who did none of the things that he just listed. These type of people will go away into everlasting punishment. But, he says, the righteous, or those people who did these types of things for their fellow man, for their brethren, into, he says, eternal life. Here, Jesus illustrates this point through other examples. If you look at the parable of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16, you don't need to turn there, but it provides a prime example of a sin of omission, what we were talking about. Because the rich man took no notice of a poor beggar, a man who had absolutely no significance in the wealthy man's busy life, but who was greatly valued by God. Maybe that's something that you can read about later on in the afternoon. Also, in the book of Luke, chapter 12, is another parable where a wealthy man fills his barn with impressive provisions while neglecting to extend a helping hand to those around him who are in need. This man stored up treasures for himself, filling his storehouses to, they, in fact, they were overflowing, it says, with far more than he could possibly ever use. 
all while at the same time showing no regard for others. Another sin of omission. This leads to a question. Whose will, then, is the most important? Well, Christ's teachings help us to understand why it is sin not to do what we know we should, in fact, be doing. And it boils down to those who, whose will is more important than our lives. Is it our will, what we want to be doing? Or is it God's will, doing what he thinks is more important for us in our lives? Because not doing what we know is right is putting our will ahead of our Heavenly Father's. And this just demonstrates to God that we don't have the desire or character to put his will ahead of our own. It shows that we are unwilling to completely surrender ourselves to him. And this is why it is, in fact, a sin. We put ourselves before God, our will before his will and what he wants done. And at times that can rub us the wrong way because we think that whatever we're thinking, that we are in the right at times. We may think that. Or when you're going through a specific trial or a series of specific trials in your life, you may think, well, I've already gone through this trial. Why would I, in fact, need to go through it again? There's always an answer. You may not get it right away, but there will come a point when you do when God shows it to you. But we always need to make sure that his will be done in our lives instead of our own. Turn to the book of James, brethren. James chapter 2. James elaborated on the requirement that we do good deeds. He asked several basic questions, in fact, about our faith. And in James 2, starting in verse 14, he says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? Asking him the question. Verse 15, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, just giving him your words, but nothing else, he's saying. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, he says, if it does not have works, is dead. James says such faith, faith without godly works, is useless, it's worthless. Such faith is of no lasting value because it doesn't change the person. Nor does it help others just to hear the words, be warmed and filled, because that's not going to do anything for the other person when they're cold and when they're hungry. It is through action, through works, through doing the good that we know we ought to be doing that God builds his nature and character within us. If we want to get rid of our selfish, sinful nature, brethren, we have to replace it with something else, don't we? We don't just magically, instantly get rid of it, though. We have to replace it with God's nature, with his thoughts and his ways. And that's just going to take time. We don't magically come into the faith. God calls us, we are converted, we are baptized, and bam, we know everything. Sometimes we may think that we do, but we do not. It takes a lifetime of preparation, of patience, of endurance, and keeping our noses in God's word, meditating on it, studying it, praying about it. That is what is needed. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, verse 16, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of of the flesh. God's Spirit working within us will help us recognize sin, brethren, and it will also 
help us to avoid it so that we no longer will fulfill the lust of the flesh. His Spirit will likewise help us recognize, understand, and grow in the ways that God has established, which will enable us to strengthen and demonstrate our faith through works, the same thing that James pointed out that are necessary for us to have. Opportunities abound for us to do good works that we know we ought to be doing. We can start right with our own families by working to make them strong, by making them our, our families warm, affectionate, supporting, encouraging. And a place for everyone to be. We have plenty of opportunities also in our spiritual family as well, within each of our own small congregations here in Buffalo, in Elmira, and when we can get together with other brethren from other congregations. They, we are all a spiritual family, and we should see each other as such. God's Word tells us in James 1.27 that pure religion is to look at orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted, in fact, by the world. So God wants us to become more of more compassionate, more caring, and more truly loving person. All this makes us reflect his way of life, reflects his character, reflects in that love that he wants us to have, that he already has, and outpours, us, outpours to us. God wants us to become more like his son, Jesus Christ. We know that. Who gave his life as a living sacrifice for all of mankind. Remember, it just wasn't for you and I that Jesus gave his life. He gave his life for all the other sinners out there in the world who have ever lived since the beginning of time. Since the first sin was committed in the Garden of Eden. Many opportunities exist, brethren, for us to do good, to encourage, to strengthen, to help, to give and show love for those in need. Going back to that sermon that I gave about a month ago here on those eight godly characteristics that you can continue to build on, in fact, to do these exact things that we are talking about now. And when we do these things, we are doing good works sacrificing our time and energy for the well-being and benefits of others. So what is the definition of sin then? What is the conclusion of this matter? Or what can we get out of it? We know that God sets high standards for us in finding and overcoming sins that affect us. Ultimately though, these definitions tell us that sin is anything that is contrary to the will of God or doesn't express the holy character of God. All those other things are sin or sinful. That is the standard that God has set for us as seen by the definitions that we looked at today. Our efforts then, brethren, to identify and remove sin can be compared to a story of a sculptor who has this great big rock, boulder, and he's chipping away at it with his hammer and chisel. Another man approaches him and asks, hey, what are you sculpting over there? Chip, 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 stops an elephant, chip, 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 chip. The other man then asks, well, how do you sculpt an elephant? Chip, 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 really quite simple. Just chip away anything that doesn't look like an elephant. We are doing the same thing when we start chipping away sins from our lives. Our goal is, with God's help, to chip away everything that isn't like God, that isn't in his nature, in his character. We are removing sin if we do that. Everything that is contrary to or doesn't express God's holy character. 
with the purpose, then, brethren, to more fully and maturely reflect God's very mind and way of life in our own life. These are the things that we need to be doing leading up to the Passover on the Days of Unleavened Bread. Not just because God commands us to, but more importantly because we should want to do them ourselves. Yes, it is very important to stay in law with God's commandments, to keep those laws in our minds and in our hearts. And so we should be looking inwardly at ourselves and being reminded of the things that are talked about today and establishing what then is sin and how can I view myself in maybe this angle or come at it from this angle to see, well, maybe there is something there that I can root out of my life. So just make sure, brethren, that you do so in preparation of the days coming ahead.